Wednesday night to come and hear me speak. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Natasha, and uh, first of all, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background on what I do, because I'm fairly sure that I have a job that I made up. <laughs> I don't think anyone else does it. Um, so about 10 years ago now, I came up with the idea that I wanted to go into schools and speak to young people about their mental health, and try and change the way that they had that conversation. And I'll explain a little bit more about why I came to that conclusion in a minute. But if you imagine, you know, I hadn't long left full-time education myself at that point. Ten years ago I was 26, I graduated from university when I was 22, and in that four-year period I'd already picked up a few ideas about what I could expect from teenagers. So I'm taking my first intrepid steps into a school, I'm working with year 10, you know, the, the year where they get the attitude. And I went in and I thought, oh, what if I don't understand what they're saying? What if they don't understand what I'm saying? What if they're rude? What if they're lazy? What if they're hoodies that stab me in the eye? These were the kinds of fears <laughs> that were going around in my head. And then, of course, I went in and I started talking and interacting with those teenagers, and I thought, oh, you're just exactly like me, but younger. So I had to ask myself some fairly searching questions about where those ideas and stereotypes had come from. And I came to the conclusion that we live in a culture which gives young people a really undeserved bad reputation. In particular, I don't know where this idea comes from that teenagers are selfish. And the more I work with teenagers, the more I realize that if they are a demographic that are categorized by anything, it's by their desire for everything to be fair. And that's the least selfish motivation you can have. So I thought, this isn't, this isn't right. Somebody should be standing up for them. So I started writing about my experiences on the ground in a blog, and that was picked up by The Independent, who was very fortunate that they gave me a column to write about the real challenges that young people were facing. And that very quickly led me into campaigning, because if you're aged between 14 and 18, you're not really a child anymore. You have needs and concerns which are distinct from those of your parents, but you also can't vote. <laughs> so that makes it very easy for those needs and concerns to be dismissed by the people in power. So I'm, I guess, a, a self-appointed voice for teenagers, their parents, and the people that teach them, both at government level and in the media. And that's informed by going into three schools or colleges every single week all over the UK, and a really wide range in both the state and independent sector. What I'm, I'm doing in schools is informed by my own experiences. Um, I have a mental illness. I have generalized anxiety and panic disorder, GAPD. That's what my doctor calls it. I call it Nigel. Um, <laughs> apologies if anyone in the room is called Nigel. I named it after Farage, if that makes you feel better. <laughs> For a multitude of reasons, but the most pertinent being that just when you think you've got rid of it, <laughs> it pops up again. And looking back, I mean, this is only a diagnosis that I got relatively recently, but looking back, I have cohabited in my head with Nigel since I was 10. My last year of primary school, I was diagnosed with asthma because I was having difficulty breathing. And I was really pleased about that because some of you may remember late 80s, early 90s, an inhaler was the ultimate playground accessory. <laughs> so I was really pleased. It's a bit like fidget spinners. You know how they were designed for children with ADD and then everyone went, well, they look fun. We used to say, can I go on your inhaler? It was, it was before social media. We had to make our own entertainment. Um, <laughs> so I, I thought I was it with my inhaler and I was using it all the time, but it didn't work because the reasons I was having difficulty breathing weren't physiological, they were psychological. But back then that wasn't understood as an option. So now, for example, it's fairly well known that eight out of 10 primary age children who go to their school nurse with a tummy ache, the reason they have a tummy ache is because they're anxious. But back then, that wasn't even considered as an option. So I was just kind of left to muddle through. And I managed that okay until I got to university. And when you talk to somebody who has a mental health journey to share, you'll normally find that there is a moment where the tectonic plates of their life shifted. Something happened and it shook them a bit. And sometimes it's losing someone they love. Sometimes it's being bullied or their parents breaking up. For me, it was moving from the very small village in Essex, where I grew up, which is called Ugly. Honestly, I promise you, it exists. <laughs> it's near Stanford Airport. Um, we're most famous for having an ugly women's institute. <laughs> so uh, I moved from there to Aberystwyth, where I went to university, which might as well have been Mars, and suddenly I'm unshackled by everything that I'd known at home, by my routines, my parents' rules, the reputations that I had, and that was incredibly exciting. 
but it also ratcheted up my anxiety to new levels and I didn't have any coping strategies for that. So I developed what I now understand as a very bad coping mechanism for anxiety in the form of an eating disorder. And it, it took me about seven years to get better. And by that point, I was 25, and I didn't have any of the things that the younger me thought I would have by the time I was 25. I didn't have a job, so I didn't have any money. I was still living with my parents, and I'm very lucky that I was in a position to be able to still live with my parents. I didn't have any friends, I certainly didn't have a partner or a romantic life, and I had this thought, and it was the thought that sparked everything off really. I remember thinking distinctly, I can't believe this has happened to me, I got all A's in my A levels. <laughs> and I realised that I'd gone through the whole of school buying into this idea that grades were the automatic key to happiness, that if I just got my head down and performed well in my exams, that everything would definitely be okay. And I realized in that moment that without your mental health, academic achievement is meaningless. So I decided that I wanted to try and change the way that schools talk about mental health. I was very lucky, I had some mental health education, a lot of people in my age didn't. But what it consisted of was people who would come in and they would do an assembly and they would spend an hour telling us about their mental illnesses. And we had people who had drug and alcohol addiction problems and people with eating disorders or who'd been hospitalised with depression and they were important stories. And I'm glad, I'm happy that there was a platform for them to be told. But they weren't given to us in any context. So the one thing that we didn't do was apply them to ourselves because... Why would we? We hadn't been through anything like that. So we kind of looked at these people and we went, well, that's what someone who's mentally ill looks like. I'm not like them. This isn't relevant to me. Now, if you think about how we teach young people about physical health, by the time you were about five, you knew you had to eat your vegetables. And then you learn about regular exercise and drinking enough water and getting enough sleep because from the moment you were born, it was acknowledged that you have a body and therefore a physical health. <coughs> And that's something that you need to be aware of, have a relationship with, that you can nurture. And it occurred to me that mental health shouldn't be any different. You know, statistically, one in three of you in this room will experience a mental illness in your lifetime. But three in three of you in this room have got a head with a brain in it. And I know that because I'm looking at you. There are no headless people in this room. So that means that every person in this room has got a mental health. This is a universally relevant conversation. So I decided we need to start from what young people are experiencing now, not where they might end up in 10 years' time. In order to ascertain what young people wanted from their PSAG, I did something really radical. I asked them. Um, I, I interviewed 500 teenagers. I said, Look, you know, what would you like more information on? And the answers that came back were related to mental health, but they're perhaps not the first things that you think of when you hear the words mental health. So it was things like body image. And I know this is difficult to believe or remember, but this was a, a cultural landscape pre gok Wan. So <laughs> for them to say body image was actually quite a radical thing at the time. Um, things like academic, ex uh, academic stress, exam stress, bullying, self-harm. So these were the, the lessons that I began to create in collaboration with experts in the field, psychologists, psychiatrists, neuroscientists, and like I say, I've been doing that now for 10 years. Now, some of you might know that in 2016, the Department for Education invited me to be their very first mental health champion for schools. Um, <laughs> and for those of you who don't know how that ended, I have a little video which gives you some background on that story. We've reached a stage where one in 10 young people has a diagnosed mental illness. There are many more that never even reach diagnosis, but struggle behind closed doors. And we see that in schools every single day. In your bedroom, you still can trying to raise standards across the board. Yes, but the increasingly anxiety and the pressure of our children is making them not want to go to school, it's making them stressed, it's making them nervous. At one end of the scale, we've got four-year-olds being tested. At the other end of the scale, we've got teenagers leaving school, facing the prospect of leaving university with record amounts of debt. Anxiety is the fastest growing illness in under 21s. 
These things are not a coincidence. columns for the Times Educational Supplement and at government level, I've said this. And they haven't made me very popular in certain circles, but I will continue to say them, because it's too important not to. Education doesn't mean anything unless it happens within the context of a healthy mind. So not well is the answer <laughs> to how it ended. Um, there is a reason why I don't make a particularly effective government advisor, particularly under the current political regime, and that's because I am deeply uncomfortable with the narratives around personal responsibility when it comes to health. I think in the vast majority of cases, it's not us that's broken, it's the world. But having said that, we do need strategies because whilst we're changing the world, there are a lot of people who are suffering. So it's all about a balance between giving people the tools that they need to be more resilient and trying to change the environment.